As natural wood species go, redwood is in a class of its own. A sustainable alternative to tropical hardwoods, redwood is grown and harvested to the highest environmental standards in the world. Named for the dark red heartwood at the center of the tree, redwood imparts natural beauty, warmth and durability to interior and exterior building applications, including decking, fencing, paneling, siding, exposed beams and timbers, pergolas, and other shade structures. To learn more about Redwood from Humboldt Sawmill, please visit GetRedwood.com. Um, this comes from Arona Woodworks, and I stole it from GBA because it was too good to keep to them. Uh, <laughs> Our build has 36 inch trusses, he writes, that only bear on the front and back walls. I'm assuming that interior walls should not tie into them because the trusses move a bit with snow load, correct? We have a six foot wide, two foot deep, 18 foot tall fireplace build out to do, and I'm not sure to how to connect this at the ceiling. The wall that is being built on also has a girder truss as, as part of it. There is still a wall missing in the picks below, the girder truss down to the loft floor. Wall framing under the girder is blue. The fireplace build out is in red. I'm not sure how to handle these details. The build out goes halfway between the front tall wall and the hallway in the picture. The first question is, okay, so the first question is, what is truss uplift? <laughs> we should specify, right? Yeah. Uh, for folks who don't understand, who wants to uh, address that? I can take that. Um, truss uplift is when you get differential movement in the wood members that make up a truss, and it causes the bottom cord of the truss to raise up. So seasonally, it could be humidity or temperature, and you can get this little rise and lowering of the bottom cord of the truss, which makes a mess of the ceiling, potentially, depending on how the drywall ceiling is connected at interior partition walls. And it can be a lot of uplift, right, Mike? An inch or two in uh, extreme cases, right? And it's usually, yes, it can. And it depends a lot on the span of the truss. You know, is it going 20 feet from from one mm -hmm. bearing wall to the next, or is it going 35 or 40 feet? So the longer that span of the truss is, as well as the size of the truss and how it's fabricated, the design of it all Im Im impact it. And there are... Um... It's, it's worth noting here that there are there are fasteners for this, right? There are the slotted clips um, that are designed. I, I know Simpson makes them. I'm sure other hardware manufacturers make them, but they're like an L bracket essentially, and there are four interior, there are four trusses connected to you know interior walls, and they basically ha where you where you um, drive the screw that connects to the bottom cord of the truss. They're slotted, and the idea there being that um, that they can the truss can lift up and down and will still be anchored at that at that point you should tell um, folks uh, yeah. brian that the the l-shaped bracket mounts the, on top of the top plate so uh yes. the bottom leg goes into the top plate and the side yes. goes into the side of the truss cord yeah and i don't know um i, I can't really picture picture right now how much that movement they allow for a couple but, inches um, is, yeah, is yeah. my recollection inches. yeah yeah so and you don't fasten the drywall at partitions, right? You, uh, I should say, right. you fasten drywall <laughs> at partitions to uh, blocking on the top plate or clips, not to the bottom of the truss cord because uh, otherwise it'll pull that drywall up and the tape will break or turn into a round kind of cove shape and look like heck. So that's the problem, right, Mike? Yeah, and usually we call it floating the drywall, and that's where it butts into the... Um, partition walls and you don't want those screws like you say up into the trusses yeah so my question is do uh so uh scissor trusses uh for folks who are unfamiliar have uh, a sloped underside uh sloped bottom cords and they create a cathedral type ceiling and uh and uh, uh i'm curious do scissor trusses have this problem of uplift like uh, how and fink trusses, which are triangular in shape, does does anyone know? So I I don't know. I've I've installed like I can't countless number of houses with both uh, flat bottom cord trusses as well as scissor trusses as well as flat bottom combination scissor trusses to get vaults in one part, and it just I've not ever seen a big difference between them. 
I read through the GBA thread and Michael Maines, a designer up in Maine who has a fair amount of experience with it, said that <clears throat> his feeling was that the scissor trusses had less bottom cord uplift than a flat bottom cord. So that was interesting, but I don't know the, the mechanics of it. Well, the mechanics are interesting. I, I, my understanding is it is a uh, seasonal moisture uh, difference that the bottom cord is, uh, has more moisture content than the upper cords, which are subject to the cold uh, air and the lower cord, which is room temperature basically because of thermal bridging uh, uh, grows mm -hmm. and uh, creates this phenomena. But maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, that would maybe key in with why I've not ever experienced truss uplift on the houses that we built, because what you just said about the thermal bridging, it's a custom in our area of southern New England to strap the bottom of the trusses. So we put one by threes or two by fours on the bottom of the bottom cords, whether it's a scissor truss or whether it's a flat bottom truss. And perhaps by decoupling it, we're not getting that that temperature difference where the bottom cord might be warmer and maybe a little bit moister than the top cord in winter. I don't know. I'm sure somebody's researched it in some paper that's buried at the forest, forest <laughs> products research lab and, you know, something like that. Well, I hope they write in. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be good to know the mechanics. Yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, and I think that scissor trusses, uh, you know, in my theory, have less of this because less of the bottom cord is, uh, you know, it's shorter. It's half as long. Uh, so any any um, movement would be half as much, right? So we've taken quite a bit of time to describe the trusses and what the problem is. But the question was about the ceiling and how that Oh, I forgot about it. the question. Yeah, right. We got to get back to that. <laughs> It's funny, we kind of summarize what the questions are embedded in the, the, the main uh, listener or, or, or GBA question, but we gotta, can't get too far on a So this is a fantastic uh, question in my uh, view. What the heck do you do about this giant penetration in a truss mm -hmm. that could move an inch or two uh, seasonally? And do you have an answer, Mike? Well, so you have the drywall ceiling coming across and it's going to butt your masonry or, or come up to it and join up against it. You're going to have at the truss itself or any adjacent trusses to your opening, you're going to have an airspace, whether you're, and that would be the same for stick framing. I think the code is two inches from any masonry. That's my recollection. Yeah. I haven't checked it recently. So you got this airspace around it. So the drywall is going to bridge over that little two inch space and go into the masonry. If you don't have some sort of a slip joint there that's planned for that's going to allow that drywall as it drifts up and down on the bottom cord of the truss or with the bottom cord of the truss, it's going to move. It's good. You're going to end up with cracking right around the chimney. And you can mm -hmm. see that a lot in, in homes where they didn't make accommodation for that. And usually they just make a little, uh, it's, it's, they either ignore it and just let it crack and people get used to patching it every couple of years or you can or you can put a uh, j bead around the perimeter of the um, a j bead around the drywall where it meets the or comes up to the chim or the fireplace uh, ma uh, the chimney masonry but you don't connect it you leave it maybe a quarter of an inch gap which now you're going to think oh we're going to have an air leak there but you got to remember this is where you get into where are you going to air seal around to the framing and then to the masonry. It's a really difficult way. It's a difficult place to get a good seal, which is why often mm -hmm. I do it on retrofits up in the attic where you're connecting the framing to the masonry using a piece of metal and some sealant and counting on that joint between the drywall and the framing below to have been sealed or not sealed and hope that just a tight joint is keeping most of the air leaks from occurring. It's a tricky uh, this spot. This is still another good reason to uh, omit masonry chimneys from your design. Uh, this is a very complicated thing to do correctly. And these trusses are ginormous, so they could move a lot. Uh, 36 feet. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we see the same problem where that masonry fireplace penetrates through the roof. Mm. Um, when they do the flashing and the mm. counter flashing, uh, and you leak, you usually cut the roof sheathing back 
about an inch, so it's not touching the frame, the uh, masonry. But then when you do the flashing, if you don't do it right and allow the flashing to move with the roof sheathing as the truss moves up and down a little bit or any framing, even rafters will do it, then you can end up with uh, the flashing. If the roof framing drops a little bit, then you end up with all these little holes where your step flashings are, where wind-driven rain can get driven up. And we see that a lot, too. So, yeah, it's a tricky spot and one you have to pay a lot of attention to. So, yeah, and uh, the problem is the flashing often fails around those penetrations, too, right, Mike? Because of the yep. movement of uh, the sheathing in relation to the uh, masonry, right? Exactly. Exactly.